inside. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning. What incredible things. We were talking a, a series today about history makers. And we, we we're trying to understand something about what all that involves. Because a history maker is someone that does just do something. They do something that's lasting. They do not just do something in a moment. They do something that that moment touches far beyond that particular moment and that setting. A history maker is a creator or a narrative of events of life. All history is birthed in the heart of those who refuse to be held captive to a moment. They make their decisions based on what they believe and see in their vision for the future. History makers, number one, they're passionate. I'm not sort of preaching yet. I'm just kind of getting you started. History makers are passionate. They are committed people. They are people who know how to focus and put everything out of their mind except the thing they're focusing upon. They are purpose driven. History makers never do anything without a reason for why they're doing it. They want a cause and effect always to be involved in what they do. It's called, it's called purpose driven. They are purpose driven in all they do. History makers do not have a problem with sacrifice. They do not mind doing the difficult so God can do the impossible. They have no problem with sacrifice. History makers are people that when they make history, it always is used to solve a problem. It's used to solve a problem. And they understand history makers, as I said earlier, are result motivated. Now, where do we get that from? We understand that, that when we talk about history makers, Abundant Life Church, for instance, Many of you are not aware of it, but back in 1977, my dad felt God called him out and healed him, and he took him into ministry, and then in 78, he started Abundant Life, and he started with 11 people. People laughed at him. The full gospel businessmen put him in a chair and prayed that God would help give him understanding that he's making a mistake of a lifetime. We're talking about full gospel, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Bible-thumping, uh, church-going Businessmen of success were looking at him because you know why? They couldn't see past the moment. But my dad knew he had seen something. God had spoken to him. God had painted on his mind, on the canvas of his mind, a picture of what the future could be. Whew. See, history makers are never about a moment. Even though they perform in the moment, their moment is never about the moment. It's always about where they're going. It's all about what they see. It's all about who they're going to affect. What, what is the purpose behind this? And so my dad and my mom started this church, and they, they started with 11 people. You know, the big story is 11 people, $14, and they ran a home. There was a little poodle dog that would sit at my dad's feet when he, when he would speak. They, so they said, you know, 11 people, $14, and a poodle dog. But it was amazing because here was a man, he was 59 years old, a man who had suffered four massive heart attacks, a woman who had gone through major cancer surgery. They had nothing in the bank. They were financially broke. They were physically broken down. But God raised them up and God healed them and God began to bless them. And they started this with 11, they started with 11 people. Now what's happened since then is 26 churches from around the world have been built out of that 11 people. You see, that moment that he started, he said, I refuse to let the moment dictate my future. It will be a stepping stone as I move to the future that I see. Yeah. Now why is that? Because history makers understand they cannot be defined here. But here, should learn, you should learn to make it a stepping stone to get there. Amen. It's fascinating about history makers. History makers aren't moved with, the, with making people happy. Let me go on this side over there. I can see this group doesn't understand that. <laughs> history makers are not interested in making people happy. They're, they're interested in creating a future that will cause people to be blessed. Amen. You say, well, if you cause people to be blessed, why wouldn't they be happy? Ask Jesus. All he did was walk around healing all those that were sick and oppressed of the devil, and they crucified him. So you understand, history makers cannot be about making people happy. See, this is our problem in our society today. We have a woke society, which is based upon the mindset and the idea of situational ethics. Situational ethics, it is a, it is a psychology term. It means this. In the moment, let's make everybody as happy as we can. We can justify the moment if everybody seems to be happy. 
It doesn't matter if what we're doing is wrong, but if everybody can feel good about it. It doesn't matter that we're all getting to a place that we're, you know, that we're, we're, we're destroying our country just so people think they're happy. And so we work off of that moment and that, that the happiness is based upon this, this setting. It, and so it's not based upon necessarily what is going to be the truth. It's based upon what I feel. Situational ethics is a feeling. It is not a reality. Whew. Come on, stay with me on that. You know, when I was in Bible college, they used to say stuff to this. I was in Lakeland, Florida. Lakeland, Florida is a wonderful place, and they have a lot of orange groves up there. And I remember when I was in Bible college, my, my junior, senior year, all the guys felt like they had to get married before they went into ministry or they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be accepted. And I, I, I didn't do that. But I had a professor that was really, he was so unique, and he said, now all you juniors and seniors, I'll never forget we were sitting in a, in a, a theology class, and he said, let me just take a moment and break from what I'm teaching. I want to talk to all the juniors and senior men that are here today. He says, now listen, I know you all think you need to get married. And I realize that the orange blossoms are out, and I realize that it smells wonderful, and the breeze is blowing. And when you go down to Lake Mira with that little girl, and you're walking down Lake Mira, and you look over her, and you realize that I'm in my junior, senior year, I need to get married. And you look at her, and the moonlight is flashing on her, her hair is shining, her eyes are sparkling, and you say, I, want to, I love you, I want to marry you. Don't do it. <laughs> he says, take her back immediately to her room in the dorm. Set your clock at 4.30 in the morning. Get up, go knock on her window. When she opens the window, if you have the same feeling, that's the one. If you don't, understand, it was just an emotion. Just an emotion. But that's how the world works off of those situational moments in ethics. But history makers aren't interested in that because they see the big picture. It's important we understand it. A history maker is going to look at, the, at what could be, the possibilities. It's never about what is, but look what can be. See, our problem right now is we look at our society today, and we look at $5 gas a gallon, and we go, oh, my God, instead of saying, wait a minute, what can we do to change that? Oh, stay with me, folks. <laughs> We look at the moment, we, we, we look at what's going on in our, our political system, we go, oh my Lord, is there ever going to be peace? No, not with the world, but with children, the children of God, we can have peace at passive understanding. See, we look at the possibilities. I look at the possibility. You know, when the doctor says you have, you have incurable cancer, fine, I'm looking at the possibilities that by his stripes I'm healed. Someone said to me once, they said, what if you're going all the way down to the moment they're about to pronounce that you're going, you're going to die any second now? I'm still believing that by his stripes I can be. I'd rather, I'd rather die on the side of the mountain than sitting in the valley complaining about what I've got. <laughs> history makers. Abundant Life has been called to be a history maker here in South Florida. It's a unique church. Just look around, folks. You know, they talk about all of this stuff that we see in society. I don't know how to tell you this, but I can see brown and black and red and white. And, uh, give me a break. Someone said to me, well, you know, well, how did you handle all the Black Lives Matter? I didn't. How did you handle all I didn't. I had people call me up, and they would say stuff. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm preaching the kingdom. What are you doing? I'm really not interested in whether you're red, yellow, black, or white. I'm interested about the kingdom of God within you being fulfilled in purpose and destiny for your future. See, abundant life is called to be a world that's totally separate from the world in which we live. A system by which people can see as you look across this congregation, every man, woman, boy and girl, every culture, every creed, every education, you are welcome at abundant life and you can all be one, not because of where you came from, but because of where we're all going. History makers. I'm too busy being a history maker than talk to you about cultural problems. Well, that bothers people. I can't tell you how many Christians have fallen by the wayside of all cultures because of what took place in 2019, 2020, 2021. That what took place in, in, in all of the mishappens and all the things that shouldn't have taken place. You say, are you ignoring it? I'm not ignoring it. I'm just saying that no one has the answer but Jesus. 
And either we believe that or we need to just stop coming to church. See, abundant life is a unique people because we walked through the pandemic knowing that Jesus is our healer. We, we've walked through, we've walked through the, the cultural and the, and, 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 the, and the conflicts and racism because we know that Jesus is the one that has joined us together. You can't separate me from my brothers and sisters. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what color they have. I don't care what gender they are. I am joined because of Jesus Christ. <laughs> History makers. We're about to come out of this thing. God's beginning to move in such a dimension in our church. He's beginning to breathe a whole fresh new flow of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And we better recognize it because yesterday has nothing to do with our tomorrow. You cannot be a history maker trying to duplicate your past. Well, you know, it used to be so good. No, it wasn't as good as you thought. If you could go back, you'd be shocked. Past is not what you think it is. It's what you hope it would have been and, and re, the way you remember it. You ever been around somebody telling a story that you of something that you were involved in and they're telling a story and you're going, it didn't happen like that. My wife does that to me all the time. Let me tell you about it. I don't remember it that way. That doesn't mean she's wrong. I just don't remember it that way. You, you know, stay with me on this. So I can't go by the past because the past is based upon the memory you have of it. Not actually what took. Oh, stay with me, folks. We're moving somewhere today. Understand that if we're going to be history makers, it's going to be predicated upon action and reaction. History makers do an action that creates reactions. It, it, it begins to move. And let me say this, an act that is, a, that is based upon creating history, it multiplies. I'll come back to that in a moment. So when we talk about something we've used in this church for years, I can't get away from it. I wrestled with it last evening going, Lord, do I really want to go there again? Because I've taught seed time and harvest here for years. But history makers understand seed time and harvest. Again, they're not interested. You know, you know, a farmer, when he sows his seed, he's not looking at the seed in the ground anymore. He's putting the seed in the ground, and he's looking at the harvest. He's got to get ready for the harvest. I can't worry about the seed anymore. And when you sow a seed of time, of talent, of, quit worrying about, you know, we have a tendency wanting to go back and dig up our seed and say, look what I did for you. Look, 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 look what I, look how, I've, and I love those churches, look what I gave to this church. You just dug it up, which means what you gave us means nothing. Exactly. Look what I gave that individual. You just dug it up. You will never, ever get a harvest out of that deal. And consequently, you will be saddened. Yes. You just altered your destiny. Right. Seed time and harvest is purpose in motion. Let me say that again. Seed time and harvest is purpose in motion. As we've heard, you heard us tell many times, it's in our books, and if you get seed, perpetual harvest is you can't take up a breath till you give the one you've got. As long as you're willing to give up the breath you have, you have many more coming to you. The moment you quit giving up what you've got, we're taking you to the hospital. You know why? Because that's the law. Every action creates a reaction. And we have to begin to judge our actions. Because if it's purpose in motion, then we got to make sure that we're not distracted from our purpose. It's so easy to let the news media distract us. It's so easy to let society distract us. It's so easy to let something bad happen to distract you from who you are and what God has called you to do. Let me say this to you. Everyone here is going to find themselves in the prayer line sometime. Okay? Which means that whatever calls me to go to the prayer line should be nothing that can control what my purpose and destiny is about. Whew. See, when I have problems, my, my problems have to be dealt with, but they're not about my purpose. Oh, okay. How many have been married 10 years or longer? Come on, get your hands up. 
Anybody have any problems in your marriage in the first year or two? Oh, I'm just checking out. Because the problems did not define your future if you're still married. If you let the problem define your future, your marriage is over with. <laughs> Y'all are looking at me like a, you know, you're like a dog looking at a pan. You don't know what to do with it. You don't have it, whether to eat out of it or do something else to it. <laughs> History makers count the cost and are willing to go through process. History makers believe in their heart and act on their beliefs. I have this unique thing in my life that God calls those that, that to our church and those that are called cannot leave. Those that aren't called eventually will have to leave. But a pet peeve I have is when I see people that have left and they come to me and they say, we wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for your ministry. And I'm supposed to believe that. Because they didn't learn to, if that were the case, they didn't learn to celebrate their calling or their gift. You don't leave your calling and your gift because of a problem. History makers understand that. They never leave their calling or purpose or the gifts that God's put in their life because they've got a problem. And the church is notorious for that. An enemy is notorious for that. See, my purpose and destiny is more important than the problem that I'm dealing with. Hmm. I believe in my heart and I act on what I truly believe. If I truly believe that God is love, then I'm going to love people. I'm not their judge or jury. I'm here to help them. Come on, folks. But we like to judge and everybody. It's amazing. We can't. History makers don't do that. History makers have personal moments they reflect upon for clarity and encouragement. There's moments. My dad had his, had his moment at Lake Ida. What a moment he had when God spoke to him and said, you are not the prodigal son, you're the elder brother. He had a moment. There's always moments in our lives that God is going to bring to us. We, we, we look in the Bible, we know Noah found grace in the eyes of God. We know that God commissioned him to build an ark. We know that Noah built the ark in spite of the critics. We know that Abraham received a promise. Guess what Abraham did? He built an altar in spite of the problem. He messed up. He, he fell on his face. He made a mistake. He said a lie. He went to a place he shouldn't have gone. But what did he do? He came back to the altar because the altar was a place that could redefine his future. And I'm going to suggest to you, if we're going to be history makers, you better find where your altar is. You better decide which is my, the place of my altar. And if it's abundant life, then you run to it. You don't run from it. You, 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 and it and if it's not, then you better find that place. We look at this. Noah built an altar. Abraham built an altar. God told Abraham, sacrifice your son. What did he do when he said sacrifice your son? He built an altar for his son. Isaac sowed in the time of famine. What did Isaac do in Genesis 26, 25? He built an altar. For so he loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said, I so love the world, I'll give my only begotten son. What did he do? He built an altar called a cross. I'm telling you that if you're going to be a history maker, you better find where your altar is. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present yourself a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. I have to know this. There's a place in the kingdom of God that God's going to ask me to lay everything out on it. And I'm afraid sometimes we don't understand that. I laughed, I was talked about my grandson and all that he's done and the achievements he's had and, and he's been so successful and one of the things that they, the producers, when they were asking him to make a, a little videotape 
and he, and he gave him his name and told him what he did. He says, and I dance eight to ten hours a day. He's 11 years old. I wonder why he's on Broadway and you're not. <laughs> Folks, if you're not committed, if you're not willing to build an altar and lay the sacrifice down, I mean, I can't tell people what to do. But I know this, if I was called to be an usher, and at one time I was, you know what I did? I read books on being ushers. You're laughing at me, but I did. I'll tell you another thing I did. When our church started being integrated, I got hold of every black magazine and black author I could find and read so I'd understand what y'all go through and what you face and what you've experienced in life so I'm not some white bread guy up here that don't understand. Somebody said to me, I don't believe you did that. Tough. I'm still here and look around. You want success? Then you're going to have to do what others will not do if you're going to be a history maker. You're going to have to pray like others will not pray. You're going to have to confess what others will not confess. You're going to have to work like others will not work. You're going to have to witness where others will not witness. You're going to have to touch people with the love of God like nobody else has ever touched them before. And then you will be a history maker. I thought Jesus was my sacrifice. Jesus was your sacrifice for salvation. Now make a sacrifice for evangelization. Mm, quietness. Exodus, Moses encountered a burning bush. Joshua had a visit from God who told him and gave him directions for success. We find in Psalms 27, 13 that David writes about his views of life and how we are to walk in success. And that I would have fainted if not believed to see the goodness of the Lord. I, I, I've got to know that God wants to bless me. I've got to know that in spite of my failures in life, he committed adultery. He committed murder. He made some major mistakes. And he said, Lord, listen, I've messed up. I'm so messed up. I've lost my, my, my child. I can lose every. I don't even care if I lose the kingdom. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because only with the Holy Spirit can I be a history maker. Don't think you're going to change the world in which you live if you're not full of the Holy Ghost. We've got a class. You can go to it. We prayed with people to be filled with the Spirit the other week. As believers, we have a born-again experience. To as many as received Jesus, they've received you. Jesus as the Lord and Savior, and they now are called a child of God. Look at somebody next to you and say, if you've received Jesus, you're a child of God. Male or female, black or white, tall or short, skinny or fat, ugly or pretty, you're a child of God. Now here, get this now. So look at the person and say, now you're a child of God, understood? Now watch this now. As a child of God, Romans 8, 31, 30 through 39 says, you're more than a conqueror. Come on, tell them. Say, you're more than a conqueror. So by knowing, if I'm a history maker and I know that I'm more than a conqueror, when something comes and sets me aside or knocks me down, I get up, I brush myself off because I know the moment doesn't define my future. In my future, I'm more than a conqueror. Well, you know, you can't believe I just, who cares if you messed up? Who really cares if you messed up? Lay it at the feet of Jesus and move on. Nobody was worse than Peter. Peter was a big blowhard. Trying to tell Jesus what to do. And then when Jesus was fulfilling being a history maker, he tried to interfere with being a history maker and cut off the guy's ear. And on top of that, then he got all upset and he felt so bad that when they said, you knew him, he started cussing and said, I don't know him. But it was Peter, lest you forgotten, on the day of Pentecost, led 3,000 people to Christ because he laid his problem at the cross and he moved on. History makers know how to leave their mistakes, learn from them, and move to the next level. 
If we're going to do this series, we've got to get some things straightened out. Come on, look at the first thing. Say, you're a child of God. You're more than a conqueror. Now, look at them again and say, now, Philippians 4.13 says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, which means no excuse. Well, it didn't work. Oh, no, 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 no. There, there's no, no, no. You can't excuse that. If you heard from God. And, I, and, and that's another thing. It make, see, history makers, before they believe something, they make sure they've really heard from God. I can't tell you how many people say, God told them this. God, don't you like people always say, God's always telling them stuff? <clears throat> if you'll do me a favor, and this will help you, just click your phone on to record when they say, God said to me. And 30 days later, go back and click it back on, and let's see whether they're still believing what God said to them, or they were just saying that because it sounded really good in the moment. History makers are the I'm going to mess some of you up. They're the same in all circumstances. I said they're the same in all circumstances. They don't change for circumstance. The only change they make is adjustments to solve and go on. They never allow the circumstance to change them to where they stop. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Hebrews 13 and 5 says this, turn to them and say, God will never leave you or forsake you. That's, that's a touchy one. I said, that's a touchy one. Have you ever done something really not real smart and been in a situation that you shouldn't be in around a bunch of stuff you really don't have any business being around? I don't know how to tell you this. God's still with you. God didn't go, I ain't going in there. <laughs> not me, man. God said, I'll never leave you and forsake you. Even in your stupidity, I'll be with you. Even in your failure, I'll be with you. God said, I'll never leave you. I'll, the only thing that will cause the presence of God to leave you is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And I don't have time to get in that because you don't qualify. People say, I think I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. That let me know right there you're not qualified. Because people who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they never ask, did they blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Ooh, I'm messing some of you up right now. God said, I'm going to go with you through the fire. I'm going to go with you through the water. God said, I'm going to be with you, and it's not going to touch you. You might go through it, but I'm going to be with you if you'll trust me. I'm never going to leave you. And so when you find yourself in some place you know you have no business being, say, God, forgive me and show me the way out. But God's always there. I, I want to get that straight because we all are human. We, we all have our moments. I'm going to look at the person next to you and smile. You know they've had their moments. Okay, I could get into stuff, but I won't there. <laughs> Galatians 3, 2 to 6, we're sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 9 says you are chosen of God. You're a chosen generation. Psalms 139 says this, I will praise you, 14 through 16, for, you are, for, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And my soul knows very well, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were written, the days fashioned for when as yet there was none of them. That you're 35, getting to be 36. You've lost your hairs. <laughs> your, you know, he flexes his muscles. Every several often he gets around, but he he, he, he acts like he doesn't. He kind of. 
But here's the point. I'm as fearfully and wonderfully made as he is. You're a grandmother. You worked your whole life. You lost your husband. Most women, in what you've gone through, where you're at, would almost say, she's a young mom. She's got her kids. She's got her husband. I mean, y'all are probably 35 years apart or more. You could be her mother. But you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Just as she is. Marvelous are God's works. And my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from God. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance. He, he, he saw you being yet unformed. In, in his book, it was written, the days fashioned for when as yet that was none of him. You know what? God knew where you were going to be today. He knew where you were going to be today because the days were fashioned before you ever saw them. But he said, I made you. I fearfully and wonderfully made you so you could not be held captive by the day that you will always look to your future. Age has nothing to do with it. As all the older people said, amen, brother. So quit saying I'm old. <laughs> I get around, it's funny, I get around people that I'm older than they are and you're talking about their age. I'm looking at them, I'm going, and I always love it because I wait. You know, they, they'll say, I'm 63 years old, I'm 64 years old, I'm getting ready to go. Oh, I don't mean, I got pains. I, I just let them talk. Get up on the tee, hit my ball. I said, oh, by the way, I'm 71. And they go, no way! No way! I said, yeah, because you talk about being old, I talk about being young. You talk about your future being done, I talk about a future is yet to happen. Don't get me on this. This is, I have a pet peeve with people that are over 65 who act like they're old. Get over yourself. <laughs> Ephesians 1 and 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Genesis 1, and verse 28. The Lord said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have what? Dominion. Oh, come on. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm in charge of my future. I'm not letting anybody dictate to me my future. Well, I'm working for, it don't matter who you're working for. They're not your boss. In fact, you need to understand something. You know the reason you work? So you can get seed to sow. With your tithe and offering, so God now has a seed that he can multiply back to you. Your job is simply to put you in a position that you can get more. Not so you can live on. Oh, I just messed somebody up. Oh, let me help you with that. Bring your tithe to the storehouse. I'll give you a revelation for your future. I'll break down some blessing or, or a benediction over that. Then you're going to give an offering. God is not mocked, because your man soweth, that shall he also reap. It will come back pressed down, shaken together, running over good measure. As the kingdom of God is of man should sow seed, go to bed at night, get up in the morning. He does not know how it grows. He just knows it grows. So my job is to have a job that I can get as much seed that I can use for the kingdom of God and a blessing to others, not to live on, so, but so God's got something to multiply. See, my job will not multiply my seed. My job will just provide seed. Oh, good Lord, help me here. Your job, your paycheck is nothing more than seed for the work that you've done. And what the ball says, here's this bag of seed I'm going to give you for this week. Now, what you do with that seed from this point on is up to you. I'm not going to give you any more seed other than what I committed myself to. Isn't it amazing how some people take their seed and they have the same job, they make the same money, but when they get to retirement, one is ready and the other one's trying to make ends meet. It's what you do with your seed that determines the future you will possess, which will create the history that you will establish. 
Oh, man. Seed time, we get back, can't get away from it. It all goes back to it. Ecclesiastes, I know that whatever man does, it shall be forever. Whew. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it, that men should fear him or reverence him. God requires us to give an account. Ooh. I'm going to have to give an account of my time, my talent, my energy. Mankind is made to be a history maker. That's our design. We have been created by God with purpose, the reason for. In other words, you have a reason. There's a purpose why you're here, Aaron. And I know you're his husband, surrounded, aid and all that. But you've got purpose to be a history maker. You have a design. Your design is different than mine. It's the ability that you have to do that which God's called you to do with purpose. Structure, though, is the kicker. Structure is where we develop the discipline and the roadmap by which we're going to walk in purpose and design. And that's where the church has fallen short. We want to come and hear all this good stuff. We just don't want to do any of this stuff. We want God to bless us, but we don't want to be involved in the structure side of it. Man, when I got a hold of this years ago, it changed my life. Because I, I no longer, it's, it's based on me now. God's expectation to those that are taking notes, these are the notes I want to give you right here. I've just set you up for this day. Man, we're ready for notes. God's expectation for you as a conqueror, as you as a person can operate in supernatural effect, because in Christ you can do all things through him. As you who have been skillfully handcrafted and designed and fearfully, wonderfully made with purpose in mind, the days established. With you knowing that God is with you, he's never going to leave you and he's never going to forsake you. Number one, in the book of Genesis chapter one, he said the first thing you, you need to understand is about being who I've created you to be is that you are to be blessed. Look at a person next to you and say, I am designed to be blessed. You know why? Because as a child of God, you have to be blessed so you can be a blessing. You can't give somebody something you don't have. That's why he told Abraham when he started this thing all over again with him, he said, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. So you have to understand you have been equipped by God to operate, I know this is going to mess some of you up, on the ethanol, the gas, the diesel, a blessing. If you don't believe that, give me 10 kids who've never learned their ABCs and let me have them. And I'll guarantee you, in a day or so, they'll be saying their ABCs. You know why? Because I will give them blessing and reward for learning it. You know why? Because we like blessing. Why? I'm designed for it. I'm equipped for it. I, I like to be. And we don't get blessed. We know there's something wrong here. And so the enemy has tried to bring into the church the uh, thing that we tell people it's not God's will for everyone to be blessed. In other words, we become abusers of the children of God in the body of Christ. Because every man, woman, boy, and girl created an image and likeness of God was created for blessing. They're created for to be blessed so they can be a blessing. You can't be a representative of the kingdom of God if you cannot pour out of yourself the things of the kingdom. And the kingdom of God says they're there to bless you. My ways towards you, my faults towards you, they're good. So you've been designed to receive blessing. When I go places, I look for favor. I really do. I look for it. I look for favor in the parking lot. I look for favor in restaurants. I look for favor at the airport. I look for favor at home. See, y'all are laughing at me. See, Looking, really, you're created for blessing, 
I'm designed for blessing. So therefore, I've got to be 100% committed to being blessed. We've got to dinner here. I'll pay. Oh, no, no, no. I'll get it. Let them do it. Stop it. You know what happens? Sometimes we get to a place that we're so blessed, we no longer know how to let other people bless us. Come on. I find myself guilty of that at times. You know. Oh, I don't need that. It's not about me. You're designed for this. Stop it. Feed the blessing machine. It's like, it's like going to the vending machine and pressing the button with no money. It just falls out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of y'all look at me like I'm crazy. You are designed to be blessed. Why? Because in your blessing, you now can bless others. Number two, you are designed to be fruitful. Fruitful. I said fruitful, productivity. Now, this is where we get mixed up here. When I say fruitful, I mean not in certain spots, but in everything. Whether it's on the job, whether it's with my neighborhood, whether it's my friends, I'm to be fruitful. I'm to be productive. I, I got to make sure that when I leave a place, I've created a history here that's going to continue going on. I got to sow some seed of time and talent and energy. I got to release blessing so other people feel valued. You cannot be fruitful if you don't understand that. Being fruitful is not just coming to church and clapping your hands and stomping your feet. Being fruitful is not just getting in a prayer line. I'm not against any of that. I do all of the above, and I love it. But somewhere along the line, i got to get my blessing and go out here and do something with it. Don't have relationships that you cannot see fruit coming out of it. That you're such a blessing to people that you see that their, their mind maybe changes, their attitude maybe changes. Their, the, be, be fruitful, guys. The way you're fruitful is with the seeds you sow. <laughs> Number three, you've been designed not for addition but for multiplication. God doesn't believe in one for one. All you got to do is go look at the talents, the five talents, the two talents, the one talent. He got all over the one, one talent. He says, you're joking me, right? You just gave me the one back? I don't think so. You're a wicked servant. You've not done a thing. He said he gave to them according to their ability, which he knew the one who got the one talent had the ability for multiplication, but he refused to use it. Don't be so set on the job and you're so happy with your position that you never try and move up. Don't be so happy with your marriage that you never do something new and exciting. Because it'll get old quick. <laughs> I talked to someone last night. We were talking. And uh, some people that we, we've met up in... West Palm, and we were sitting there talking, and, and I was talking to the lady, and they're Christians, and I said, uh, now you and your husband have a date night every week, right? Well, you know, it's kind of hard for us, you know. We had one date night in the last year. I said, so how's it gone? She didn't have to tell words to me. She just told me everything about their marriage I needed to know. You know why? Their marriage isn't fruitful. It's not talking about having kids. It's talking about giving in to one another so they can begin to enjoy. Their marriage can multiply in relationship, multiply in witness, multiply in, 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 in being that, that unity where the two become one. Don't ever settle for one thing. You're, you're designed to multiply. I'm designed for a raise. I'm designed for ideas that will change my life. 
that will cause my life to be in the multiply. Now, I'm designed as a witness, not to just witness to one person in 20 years. Come on, folks, stay with me. Now you say you're getting on. No, I'm not. I'm trying to get your mind stirred up. I want you to think this way. When I walk out in my listen, when I walk out, I'm always looking for ways I can multiply my my effectiveness wherever I'm at. Hmm. He said to them in the in the, in the in the book of Genesis in the garden. He said, "Fill the earth, replenish it." In other words, make where you've been a better place. Don't leave it empty. Don't leave where you've been empty. If you're leaving it, make sure it's full. Make sure you replenished. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. There's nothing worse than run out of something. Now let your mind roam with that. Take authority. See, if we're going to be history makers, we've got to learn to take authority. Spiritually, we have to learn to take authority. We've got to call those things that be not as though they are. We've got to begin to speak and act and talk like we really know what we're talking about. I can't stand to be in a conversation and they ask me something I know nothing about because I've learned now, I go, I don't know. I don't know why everybody thinks a preacher should have an answer for everything. I don't. You know why? Because what I don't have an answer for means I have no authority there, so I need to keep my mouth shut. Because if I don't have any authority there, it's going to come on me. But when you're an authority, it can come back on you. Learn to walk in your authority. Learn what the Word of God says. Learn your position, whether it's on the job or whether it's with your kids. Learn Authority doesn't mean I'm going to be all big and bad and I'm taking over here. It means I just know who I am to the point that I'm not going to change my dialogue. I'm not going to change my position. And when I speak, I'm speaking out of authority. In other words, I'm speaking out of what I know is true. Learn how to have dominionship. You hear most Christians, they wait till they get in a moment and then they try to act like they're all bad. Come on, you come on, folks. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you, you something happens, they go, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You've got no authority. I mean, it's a joke, man. You have no dominionship here whatsoever. I take authority of you, Satan. Yeah, right. I've heard you before. Next. I was in a youth pastor and years ago and there was a Wednesday night service going on and three of the deacons came and pulled me out and they said we need you to come to the office the pastor's office service I said well where's the where the service is going the pastor's speaking but we got a problem I said okay so I walked in they said this woman's demon possessed and I'm seeing three deacons full of the Holy Ghost Sunday school teachers and they're going She's, she's got a demon. I mean, you found me at a Bible class. I, I, I just know what I know, you know. I, just, I, didn't, know, I didn't know what they knew. You know, where I, I just looked at it, and it was almost humorous to me. And the lady, she, she right, literally levitates up, top, uh, up off the floor. I know who you are. And I started laughing. And the deacons are up against the wall going, you see that? I said, if you know who I am then you know that you cannot continue in this lady. In the name of Jesus, you come out of the lady, leave the office, and leave me alone. i got a youth service going on. She shook. She fell. It left. And I left the deacons against the wall. <laughs> lifted up the lady, put her in the chair, and I said, you're going to be okay. They'll minister to you later. And I walked out. My dominionship did not happen when I got there. I already was walking in it before I arrived. <laughs> dominionship is not in the moment. It's a lifestyle. That's right. Wow. Okay. John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not before to steal to kill, and to destroy. Write this down. But I've come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Now, Satan, the thief, he's talking about uh, 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 the thief stealing. 
He's going to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, I've come that they might have life. Now, the word life there, in the original text, it is the life of God. It's zoe, Z-O-E, zoe. It is the essence and being of God himself. It's the God type of life. I've come that you might have the God type of life. So why would you not want to participate in the life that God has in you than in the life the world's trying to dictate to you? I've come that you might have life. Now watch this. The life of God and have it till it overflows your life. And we want to translate it overflows the borders. It's talking about overflowing your life. In other words, I know what I'm feeling, but I still choose to let God be in charge. Overflowing life. John 15, 7 through 8. I, I won't, you know, we've already talked about that a lot. It's about bearing scripture. Let's go to that, John. Let's go to John 15. If you abide in me, everybody say abide. The word abide means stay in a state of expectation. If you stay in a state of expectation in me. That's in the restaurant. That's on the golf course. That's laying out in the sun. Wherever you may be. And my words, ooh, abide in you. In other words, you allow the word to keep expectation in you. So when something happens, what comes out of me is my... You ever notice when somebody gets in a real bad spot again, something happens, what comes out of them tells you what's in their heart? Anybody have something come out that you wish you could take it back in? And everybody's laughing at you. <laughs> but you're a preacher. I know I couldn't help myself. God help me. You got to work at it, man. I said, you got to work at it. But the Word of God has to be in expectation in you. It can't be expectation in you if you don't study it. You see what I'm saying? He says, hide it in your heart. Meditate in it day and night. Hiding it keeps you from sin. Meditating it causes success. Wow. You will ask what you will or what you desire, and it shall be done for you. How many desires have we lost on the rocks of life because we didn't have the first part right? And we change our theology to accommodate our tragedy and justify the failure rather than saying, I refuse to let that define me. Wow. Next verse. But this my father, he's glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciple. In other words, what declares who you are to the world is that you are a fruit bearer. Next verse. Verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. So stay in a state of expectancy in my love. No matter where, how many times I've fallen down, brushed myself up, I'm expecting. God didn't send his son to condemn me. He sent his son to save me. I'm abiding in his love. There's penalty for things that you do wrong. You sow a bad seed, you get a bad harvest. But you don't have to be defined by the harvest. Be defined by the love of God in your life. Next verse, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So Jesus abides in this thing. Psalms 35 and 27. Psalms 35 and 27. Let them shout. in church Stop it. for joy and be glad why would you shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause now everybody get this is God's righteous cause God's righteous cause turn to the person say to them God's righteous cause this is not a Rick Thomas teaching. This is not some philosophy. This is the Word of God who talks about His righteous cause. 
And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. This is the shouting for joy and being glad. Why? Because we favor the call. What's the righteous cause of God? He wants to be magnified. And when he's magnified, he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. So that means to be a true believer, it's impossible for you to be a loser. But I've been losing. It's because you were taught wrong. You're destroyed from lack of knowledge. It, you got to grow in this. <laughs> you take a child and you do everything you can to train and teach them. And then you put them in kindergarten. And hopefully kindergarten is going to teach them some basic things of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The alphabet. Can you help them understand some numbers? Why? Because in first grade, they're going to start maturing. God. We as believers take the word of God and we realize it's God's pleasure. He takes pleasure in our prosperity. This is his righteous cause that we should be happy with. But in order to understand that, we've got to grow. In other words, we've got to mature by taking those points that I gave you a while ago and applying them to my life and beginning to develop in them. I didn't get to where I am overnight. I don't have what God has done in my life because all of a sudden I read it and I said, oh, wow, that works for me. No, I had to apply it. I had to learn to abide in it. I had to learn to let it abide in me. I had to let it be a part of my confession. I had to let it be a part of my life that no matter what happened, I didn't change what I believed. See, I knew when we got into this thing back in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, we read the books by, by, by Ken Copeland that, 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 that God said, you need to understand something about the troublemaker. So I read the book of The Troublemaker, and I understand God does not create trouble, only the enemy. I read the book on righteousness. I realized, wait a minute, Jesus took my sin that I could be right. In spite of my lousy self in the natural, he made me something supernatural. He took my sin, and I took his righteousness. I, it took me a while to get that in my spirit. To understand that I am the righteousness of God. There's people today in the body of Christ, preachers today, that will never say they're right with God. And then I got a hold of the laws of prosperity. Lord, how mercy. I began to read what the scripture said. And I thought to myself, maybe I didn't come from the right side of the tracks like some people. Maybe I didn't come from a family that just poured all kind of wealth on me. Maybe I, I, I didn't have the greatest education that some people have had. And that's all true. Maybe I'm shorter than most people. And I am. But I found out it doesn't matter because we were fearfully and wonderfully God knew my ways. You do not allow the world to define you by what they think of you. Because they're going to think of you in a lot of weird, different directions. And never allow other believers to define you by what they think of you. You're so judgmental at times. See, I want to be a history maker. Hallelujah. It took me a while to where I was so secure in who God said that I was that I could take my first step of authority and my second step of dominionship. Once I said authority and dominionship, 
I understood how to be fruitful. I understand how to multiply. It's like little kids learning to walk, and then they begun to run. And I've been running for I don't know how many years now. And I'm still running. And I'm running. I don't care what it looks like. Don't care what it smells like. Don't care what people talk about. I really don't care. You know why? Because I'm caught up in him. He's my God. He loves me in spite of myself. He's declared victory in my life, even though in the natural, I don't know how to walk in it. But he said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you, and I'll, I'll walk with you, and I'll send my Holy Spirit and my word, and I'll teach you what you don't know. God is a good God. And God's blessed me all the days of my life. When I go to heaven, I pray to God I've left such a wake of history that people will be talking about, not Rick Thomas, but will be talking about the truth that was demonstrated in love that changed their lives. Because that's all that matters. Hey, thanks for watching the Abundant Life YouTube channel. We hope that today's message has blessed your life. And don't forget, if you enjoyed today's sermon, you can always subscribe as well as share this message with your family and friends. Also, to support the ministry, be sure to hit the giving link located in the description below. Through your giving, we're able to continue to spread the gospel and reach our world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Also, you can join us Sundays for all of our stream services on Facebook Live and AbundantLife.tv. And remember this, that God is a good God. He loves you and he wants to bless you today. Take care.